I've got 18 minutes to show you three architecture projects, tell you why I have a problem with problems, and introduce this concept of radical optimism. So let's start with a rainbow. I love rainbows. I think they're just beauty. They're, they're, they're beautifully evanescent. And um, I enjoy the fact that they remind us that we all live in the same world, but we perceive that world differently. So all raindrops reflect and refract light in the same way, but only some of the light from some of those raindrops reaches your eyes and becomes your rainbow. My rainbow is different, although I'm standing right next to you, and that's kind of how the world works, and that's quite interesting. The other reason why I like rainbows is that they often appear right after it's rained, which means people fold away their umbrellas, and that's a really good thing. I hate umbrellas. This is my vision of hell. People hiding behind these weapons that are, are disguised as, as devices to uh, keep you dry. Um, there seems to be something wrong with umbrellas. They, they, you know, they turn inside out, they break very easily, they, um, they poke you in the eye. And I put some of the blame for this on Samuel Fox, who in 1852 invented the steel-ribbed uh, umbrella. Now, very few people seem to be interested in updating that design. We just keep making the same umbrella over and over again. Um, but some people have tried. This is one of my favorites. It's an aerodynamic umbrella called Sense. Uh, my very favorite is the 1992 Sky umbrella, designed by Tibor Kalman. This is the very epitome of a radically optimistic design. Okay, so it's raining, it's horrible, I don't feel good, but hey, it's okay, because I'm carrying my own little sunny sky, cheerful little sunny sky in my umbrella. Um, so I do like, uh, like rainbows a lot, and obviously they're just made from water and light, and when I started out in architecture school quite a few years back, I realized that why don't I bring these two things together, my love for the, for the, for the rainbows and my hatred for the umbrellas. Why can we not build an artificial rainbow and use that as a sign for a shop where we could sell new umbrellas and change the world and make people a lot happier. So that was one of the very first architecture projects that I ever did. Many years later, I did what I thought would be my final school project in architecture, uh, and I called it June Arenaceous Anti-Desertification Architecture. But since the E in TED stands for entertainment, I thought I shouldn't waste half of this session trying to explain what Arenaceous means. So instead, I changed the title to June Don't Worry, Be Happy. That's a really serious title. I mean, it sounds a bit like a joke, but it's a very, 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 really very serious title. Uh, and the reason is that architects are trained to solve problems, but I don't really believe in architectural problems. I have a problem with those problems. And um, I do think that we need to somehow adopt a much more happy um, point of view. We need to embrace a kind of radical optimism. Yes, it's true that we live in a world that's a much scarier place, than before we knew about environmental threats like CO2 emissions or melting polar caps or, or whatever we talk about. But if we start thinking about those as facts and as the way the world is today and just start designing from them, we might end up with some really interesting new ideas. So that was the starting point for this scheme to build a 6,000 kilometer long habitable wall right across the entire African continent in order to try and stop desertification. That's about the size of the Great Wall of China. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's a pretty big design, but it's, uh, it's a new idea, a new way of going about doing things. And it's not about thinking about problems, it's about thinking about challenges and how to meet those challenges. So I'll talk about an environmental threat, and that is desertification, and I'll talk about an architectural response, which is this habitable sandstone wall, made from biologically solidified sand, and I'll come back to what that means in a minute. Now, sand is a fascinating material. One billion grains of sand come into existence in the world every second. That's a cyclic process, so mountains uh, degrade and get eroded, and then some of the sand grains uh, cement naturally together back again into sandstone, and then that weathers, new grains break free, and so on. And so we have this cyclical process. Some of those grains at times aggregate on a massive scale into a sand dune. In a way, the static mountain becomes a moving mountain of sand, but moving mountains can be a bit dangerous, so I'll try and explain why. Dry areas cover more than one-third of the Earth's land surface. Um, 
Some of those areas are deserts, others are being seriously degraded by the sand. Right south of the Sahara Desert, we find the Sahel. The name means edge of the desert, and this is the area most closely associated with desertification. It was here in the late 60s and early 70s that uh, major droughts made three million people dependent on emergency food aid, with up to 250,000 people dying. That's a catastrophe waiting to happen again, and it's one that gets very little attention. Somehow, desertification just seems to be a bit too slow for our kind of media. Uh, saturated culture. They, they, desertification just doesn't make the headlines. Um, there are too few crying children, smashed up houses, nothing like a tsunami or a Katrina. But it is a problem. It's affecting 110 countries all over the world, uh, some 70% of the world's agricultural drylands. And you can kind of see a worst case scenario happening here. You get drought, then you get increased desertification, you get crashing food supplies, famine, water scarcity, political instability, possibly. Um, forced migration of people, and then you get warfare and crises. I mean, that's, that is the worst case scenario, but, but it's something that might happen if we turn a blind, blind eye uh, on this problem. So, how far away is this potential crisis? Well, I went to northern uh, Nigeria, to a place called Sokoto, and to a little village outside of Sokoto, which is called Gidankara, to try and find out. The dunes in this area move at a pace of around 600 meters a year. So that's a little bit more than a meter a day that the Sahara eats up of the fertile land that people use and live on. Uh, so this is me with the elders in Gidankara. I like to point out that I'm the second person on the left in that photograph. Um, they had to move their village hut by hut in 1987 as this huge dune threatened to overtake the, the entire village. This is where the village used to be. It took us about 10 minutes to climb to the top of that dune, which goes to show why they had to uh, move to a safer location. Now, the good news is that four years ago, uh, 23 African countries came together to start building something they called the Green Wall Sahara, or the Great Green Wall Sahara. And the initial plan called for a shelter belt of trees to be planted right across Africa, from Mauritania in the west all the way to Djibouti in the east. That's a traditional way of coming to terms with desertification. What you need to do in order to stop a dune is you need to make sure that the, the grains of sand don't avalanche over the crest of the dune. And a good way of doing that is to use some kind of sand catcher. Trees and cacti are good for this. They bind the grains of sand to the ground. One of the problems with planting trees, though, is that the people in these regions are often so poor that they chop them down for firewood. So there's an alternative to just planting a shelter belt of trees and hoping that, that people don't chop the trees down for firewood. And what my suggested proposal for a sandstone, a habitable sandstone wall essentially does is three things. It adds a roughness to the surface texture of the dune, which helps binding down the grains to the ground. It adds physical support spaces for the trees in that region. And it provides habitable spaces so that people can actually live and work closer to the trees. And the thinking, obviously, behind that is that if you move people closer, they can help safeguard the trees, both from other people and from the forces of nature. So, in a way, a sand dune is very much a ready-made building. It's already a building waiting to happen, in a way. You just need to solidify uh, the parts of the dune that need to be solid for you to, to be able to live in it. And then you excavate the sand away from that structure. Either you can excavate it by hand, or you can have the wind excavate it for you. So the wind carries the sand onto the site, and then it carries the excess site away from the site, sand away from the site. Um, so the next obvious question is, well, how do you actually go about solidifying a sand dune? And the answer could be that you use these guys, a microorganism called Bacillus pasteuri, readily available in marshlands and wetlands and stuff like that. Uh, and it does precisely that. It helps solidify sand into sandstone naturally as a naturally occurring process. What happens when you pour these uh, bacteria onto a pile of sand is that they start filling up the voids in between the individual grains of sand. And then a chemical process produces something called calcite, which is a kind of natural cement that binds the grains together, and that's how it becomes solid. Um, so here I am trying this process out in the laboratory at UCL in London. Um, Experiments that yielded sand that was kind of solid, but 
what I realized was you need to, to flush through the bacteria about six times to make sure that uh, the sand gets properly saturated. And we didn't really have the machinery to do that properly, but that's something that could be solved on a larger scale. So how much would this cost? Well, if we neglect for a moment the cost of the machines that we would need to have and just look at the material cost, a cubic meter of concrete would be something like $90. A cubic meter of bacterial sand would be something like $11. So that's a pretty good number. How would you go about constructing something like this? Well, I'll show you two different ways that I've thought of. The first is to use a kind of balloon structure out in the desert uh, in which you grow the bacteria. You then allow the sand dune in the background in this photo to wash over the structure, and you somehow disseminate the bacteria. You pop the balloon, if you like. And using the permacultural strategies that we just heard about in five or 10 or 15 years, we can start using the temperature differences between the, the surface of the dune and the interior of it, start harvesting condensation and green the desert from within. The other way would be to use something called injection piles that we would uh, stick straight into the dune and then start working uh, up a first initial surface inside of the dune itself. And then we'd pull those injection piles up and that way we can create almost any shaped surface that we want. And then we just excavate the sand and there we have the building. What would it look like? Well, I used, as my architectural inspiration, something called tefoni, which is a cavernous rock structure that I found on the site in Sokoto. And I realized that if I scale these forms, these beautiful forms up, they would give me a really good starting point for design that would allow light to filter through and would give good um, opportunities for ventilation and thermal strategies and so on. And part of the formal control of this structure would be left to nature, which I think is a really, really beautiful thing. We couldn't control it perfectly on a kind of granular scale. So you would always see the trace of the bacteria being harnessed to sculpt the desert into these habitable environments. Um, so quickly showing you some of the interior shots and a bit of a... Um, an animation over the structure. Now, why is this important? Well, within a century, it's very likely that we lose about one third of the arable land on this planet. There are, uh, sorry, there are millions of people at risk of desertification, uh, especially in Africa and China. And frankly, we're putting our heads in the sand. And I think this is a good kind of initial way of opening up a discussion for what to do about this problem since we don't get those headlines uh, that I talked about. So this was a project that I made as a school project, as I told you. And I thought it was a really neat school project, a new way of building architecture and so on and so forth. Um, and I thought everyone would be very happy with it. So you'd be excused for thinking that these are some sketches by Leonardo da Vinci, but they're actually portraits of me in July last year when my teachers told me that I had failed my course and that they hated the scheme. Uh, they didn't believe in it at all, and I was devastated. I totally crashed at this point. But then just a few weeks later, um, I got to go to Morocco and accept the first prize in a competition for the very same project. Um, so that was quite unexpected. Uh, and I, I realized that the way that I should deal with that is really to not trust in my teachers. Uh, and to think about this not as a problem, but as a potential for some radical optimism. So I sent an email to uh, this guy called Jeff, who I think is the best architecture critic on the planet. And I asked him if he wanted to cover this on his blog, and half a year later he did. And that in turn um, gave rise to a lot of different articles being posted about this scheme. Um, my favorite of which is this one, the LA Times calling it a mad scientist plan. I quite enjoy that. So maybe that was what caught the attention of the, the TED Global organizers who invited me to present this project this summer. And that, in turn, gave rise to some other articles, uh, amongst others this one, which proves that my teachers were wrong. Bacteria can prevent desertification in the future. It's official, it's on the internet, so it has to be true. <laughs> right, but I still had to go back and do an extra year at school. So I decided to try and play it safe and come up with something that would just kind of take me through the year. Uh, so I, I, I drew this 180 meter tall uh, skyscraper. It's a skyscraper hotel made entirely from load-bearing bricks. Now, this is a ridiculous idea. No one would ever build a, a, a building like that out of 
basically only bricks. And the reason for that is that the walls become very, very thick at the base of the building. In this design, about five or six meters thick. Uh, so especially uh, where I put this building on Manhattan in New York, where the prices are astronomical, no one would ever do this. So needless to say, my tutors absolutely loved it. Uh, here's a kind of far away image. This is a close up of it. From a design point of view, it was actually not nonsensical at all. I was trying to work from corner to corner, just designing individual corners and manipulating the corner of a space to turn it into a new kind of space, working with the assumption that if you change the corner, you change the rest of, of the space. So that gives rise to a lot of interesting moments in this building where the corners really control where we go next, stairs from corners to corner and, and, and so on. Uh, so if you stretch a corner, for instance, you get new views, new vi vistas. Uh, if you open a corner, light falls in, you can look out, and so on and so forth. So that was a kind of radically optimistic way of trying to make it through the year without going completely insane. And I think it would be quite nice to wake up in a hotel room that looked like this, rather than your normal hotel room, although Jesper, as he told you, just gave me uh, an opportunity to have a look at a very nice hotel room. That's quite different. Yet, the question remains, why would we want to, to build those very, very thick walls? Well, maybe this guy, Henry Liu, is onto something. A few years ago, he invented something called fly ash bricks, uh, which use waste material, fly ash, which is a byproduct of uh, firing coal in, in plants and so on. Uh, and, and instead of sending that to landfill, we can now make new materials and build from them. And maybe then, by using a lot of that material, we can actually turn it into something positive. I don't know, some people call that green greenwash. I'm not sure if it's the right way to go, but it's an interesting starting point for discussion. So, what am I trying to do with this sand dune idea? Let's go back to that for a second. I'm trying to do two things. The first thing is that I'm working with a Spanish construction company to try and turn it into an actual valid structural material. Uh, and if I'm, I won't do the sales pitch, but if anyone's interested in a new summer house made from bacterial sand in a few years, then I want to hear from you. Uh, the other thing that I'm doing is that I'm trying to spread the idea and see what other people might do with it that I haven't thought about. So a week ago, I did this workshop in Jerusalem. And I'll just quickly run through a few images. We gave 12 design students, industrial designers and architects, a radically optimistic brief to try and come up with new um, concepts for this. So they came up with ideas of weaving stone, ideas of using child labor to uh, have the traces of children's games turn into architecture. This is reverse archaeology, and this is a vessel for um, using the bacterial, for storing the bacterial culture and then use that to build new structures. So, don't worry, be happy. This is the guy who invented that or designed that umbrella that I showed you at the beginning, the sky umbrella. He's called Tibor Kalman. Uh, he once said in an interview uh, that we live in a society and a culture and an economic model that tries to make everything look right. But by definition, when you make something no one hates, no one loves it. So I'm interested in imperfections, quirkiness, insanity, unpredictability. That's what we really pay attention to anyway. We don't talk about planes flying, we talk about them crashing. Okay, so I propose um, an alternative. I think this is the big problem with problems. We tend to focus on them and confuse them with what is actually important. So I would say, instead of trying to start designing something by coming up with a problem and then solving that in a way that makes no one hates your solution, try and come up with a challenge or find a challenge and then see what you can do using that challenge, without crashing, as I crashed when I was failed for that June project, and try and come up with something that's imperfect, that's quirky, that's insane, that's unpredictable, but that someone might actually love. Thank you.